Russell Riley, thanks for being here. There we go. Thank you, that, was, that was great. You need to know, now that we're off, off camera, is this book was published in 1999. And so it's not a, it is not, it, it, it's, it's being revived, and I'm thrilled to have it revived because I spent far more time working on this than I think anything else I've done in my professional career, so. Well, and, and go the, ahead, tell them how well, this Well, and the happened. way this, uh, the, the way all of this sort of came to pass was that as, after the first year project began, as all of you have heard a good bit about, and the decision was made that race would be one of the dozen topics addressed in that, and then I was asked to, to, to edit that volume to, and to write one of the essays associated with it, and all that is online now at the first year website. And so I was up here late one night, I sometimes work in the middle of the night, I'm up here at one or two o'clock in the morning uh, working on that, and I go down to the copy room downstairs, and Russell's office is not far from there, uh, and I walk by the door to his office, I'm the only person in the building, and out on a table outside his door is a copy of the book. And I've just been doing all this research on race and the presidency, and I look down, and the title is The Presidency and the Politics of Racial Inequality, Russell Riley. <laughs> Little did I know, I was embarrassed. Um, uh, and, I, and, uh, and I thought, wow, why am I, <laughs> why am I editing this volume? But this is the guy who actually knows these things. But uh, it's a brilliant book, uh, and, the, uh, and just a brilliant composition of a history that we don't understand. Um, and Russell is, if you don't know Russell very well, and I've, I've said this before, so I can, uh, he knows I'm not just blowing smoke. Um, uh, Russell is, is, is one of the very sharpest minds uh, of all the people who are associated with the Miller Center. So, uh, so it's great that we're able to do this. Thank you very much for a brilliant yeah. resume of the struggle for liberty and justice. However, your comments about the going forward to the Hispanic community yes. was very interesting. But I'd like to suggest going the other way. Uh, I've just read a book uh, called The White Cargo, 2015, about the early 1600s when thousands of Irishmen and women and children were brought over here and enslaved and were treated, the book suggests, worse than the blacks were. And part of the solution was to make blacks with Irish to produce mulattoes because mulattoes brought a better price than blacks or uh, Irish. Now that was a process from 1600 up till the first presidency. Mm -hmm. Now that was a resolution of that to some extent. Now what if you, now we have now in the bully pulpit a bully. <laughs> and that's <laughs> ironic. <laughs> Lift your microphone up. Yeah, okay. Oh, excuse that's, me. Yeah, I think, uh, it, I, I it is. It's, it's the first my experience of trying to understand what is irony, and and it brings me to the question of the the second article in the Constitution brought us this bully into the White House. Yeah. Well, I, on the on the the first part of the question that would have preceded my. Uh, my study considerably, yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I I do in the book address the, the the relevance of this theory that I've developed about the nation keeping role to issues apart from uh, uh, African Americans. Um, so, for example, on questions of women's rights, it was you know it's notable that uh, much of the great movement there occurred uh, around World War One. Uh, when the, uh, again, you've got a sort of elevated standing of the presidency. Um, the case of, of Japanese Americans, which has been referred to uh, uh, more recently, again, is the story of uh, World War II and the internment um, that was upheld by the Korematsu decision and then later on, uh, you know, much later on, uh, there were uh, corrections made both politically and in American culture. I mean, when I was in graduate school, Korematsu was treated as, as an embarrassment, and it was, it was taught that way. Uh, I, I do wonder if part of what we're dealing with in the contemporary situation is simply a failure of our cultural education, uh, that we don't, we don't have an understanding about uh, how these things have been dealt with in the past and how 
you know, the, there are shameful episodes in American history. I'm, I'm pr I fly the, the American flag and, and, and proud to be an American and travel abroad, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that I don't believe that one has to shine a spotlight on the negative aspects of history in order to fully understand it. And this book is full of stories about American presidents that don't, uh, that aren't a part of that cultural, that natural cultural inheritance. But if you don't understand that history, you, you come to expect things of the institution that are uh, uh, quite unnatural politically. And I would be very cautious about the whole Irish slavery thing. Uh, that, that, that's a, um, uh, that, that has become a popular, um, the book that you're talking about, I doubt, is, is though maybe it is part of this, um, uh, that has be in this era of, um, of factual relativism, let's call it that, you know, this tendency to say, uh, uh, I mean, just like the controversy that just came up about that the White House statement on, uh, on, uh, on well, no, no, no. So the previous to that, but the the reference to was it on Holocaust Day? But the but there's no reference to the uh, to Jewish victims of the Holocaust, um, and the and this tendency to start saying, well, look at all these other people who were murdered. Look at the Roma and these other people in these other countries, uh, which there may be some factual value to being aware that there were other victims of something like that, but when it's presented in a way that diminishes the enormity of the crime that was committed against the principal targets of that event, uh, then it becomes, becomes problematic. And there is a whole traffic uh, these days of white supremacist um, fake news and fake history aimed at trying to establish that, that Irish, that enslaved Irish people were the equivalent of African Americans, and somehow that's supposed to make the enslavement of African Americans less of a bad thing. And of course, uh, there's there's bad, lots of bad things have happened in the world, but there's no meaningful comparison. I, I, so I'd just be very cautious about about I, that. As a Riley, as you would expect, I would be sympathetic to consideration of Irish history. <laughs> You're aware, of course, of my knowledge about. Uh, the speaker at Monticello a number of years ago. Right. And the fact that he was questioned, he was a black historian who was questioned by the NAACP about why he didn't participate in the projects that the NAACP had. Right. You're an African American, you ought to do that. He said, no, I'm not an African American, I am an American. Yeah. This is the point that is, needs to be gotten across. That's point number one. The second point is, that I also introduced him many years ago, a fellow named Douglas Southall Freeman, mm -hmm. who wrote many, many sure. uh, books about uh, the Civil War and, or the war between the states, whichever you prefer. Uh, unfortunately, he omitted a few things about a fellow named William Mahone. William Mahone happens to be a relative of my deceased wife, and he was a uh, fellow who ran for the Senate He'd been a general in the Confederate Army. Mm -hmm. He'd been a, uh, a very strong general for Robert E. Lee. He, on the other hand, ran for the Senate after the war was over. He made contributions to the Virginia State University, something nobody understands or knows about. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he also actually uh, ran for the Senate with the support of the black community and won. I just want to let you know that there are some fake things out there. Sure. He must have run as a Republican, by the way, if he had black support. I mean, that would have been typically the case in that period. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, but sure. Uh, well, I, I, it's, it's worth commenting because you had, you had indicated that, uh, that there were uh, Republican inroads in the South. When I was working for the state legislature in Alabama, I was a chief legislative aide to the lieutenant governor until 1982. We would occasionally get telephone calls from scholars wanting to speak to our minority leader, and I would, they would direct the calls to me because I was still in college at the time, and I'd scratch my head and say, I'm not sure what you're after, and they said, well, I'm sure you're a Democratic majority state. Can you tell me who the Republican leader is? I said, we don't have any. <laughs> in Alabama in 1982, as late as 1982, there was not a single Republican member serving in the state uh, Senate. And in 1982, there would have, I said routinely, I said, I think there are three or four Republicans in the House of Representatives. They don't have a caucus. If they want to meet, they just gather on a bench in the rotunda and they have a conversation there. So 
That doesn't mean anything to any. <laughs> well, <laughs> it has no relevance to our discussion. Well, but it also, things. but it does speak to, for instance, that I mean, again, back to the topic of the, the way that it's so often the case that presidents who we remember that they did something good as it related to race, but if you peel back the layers of why that act, that event occurred, you so often will find. Uh, a less than principled motivation. Sure. It's a reaction to an event or it's a need for something. So for instance, you mentioned earlier Booker T. Washington visiting the White House right. at the invitation of Teddy Roosevelt. Well, that was a highly, that was intended to be a symbolic gesture mm -hmm. uh, very early after he becomes president, after the assassination of President McKinley. Uh, you know, Roosevelt's a totally accidental president. You know, the reason he's vice president is because the New York Republican Party didn't like him and they wanted him out of New York, so they pushed, they, they get McKinley to replace his vice president uh, in, in um, uh, in 1896, I guess, um, uh, to be, so he becomes the vice president, and then our, whenever that was, then McKinley's assassin, uh, or 1900, yeah, and then uh, McKinley's assassinated in 1901, and suddenly this, this guy accidentally becomes president of the United States, uh, and then becomes one of the most famous ones ever. Mm -hmm. he, he has generally progressive views, and, and conscious views on race, uh, but his mother was from Atlanta, from near Atlanta, and from a slaveholding family. Mm -hmm. His father was uh, from, you know, from New York. Mm -hmm. uh, but so he had sympathies to the South, and he still believed that there was some way that Republicans could, sure. could actually win in the South at some point, so he wanted to make those overtures. But in particular, his big issue was, since he was an accidental president, he was afraid he could not be renominated in 1904. And the way that things worked at that time was that African Americans couldn't vote anywhere in the South in mm -hmm. any meaningful numbers at, by that stage. And so there were no Republican, uh, there were no Republican votes or black votes in a general election. They couldn't, wouldn't affect the outcome of the final election. But you had a black Republican party that had delegates to the Republican to the National Convention in the summer of 1904. And so Teddy Roosevelt needed to make gestures that would appeal to black Republicans right. so that they would participate in his nomination, even though they would then never be able to vote for him in the general election. Mm -hmm. And so the so you have these perversions sure. of the of of how history plays out mm -hmm. and why people did certain things. Mm -hmm. In the end, Teddy is uh, is terrible on race. By the end of his, his second term, he has He's become a terrible president on race, and he's done terrible things uh, uh, both in the country. Uh, he supported the, this brutal repression of the, the revolution in the Philippines, which was a revolution of black Filipinos, uh, and that was fought on very racial terms. He ends, up, he ends up becoming just a terrible figure on race by the end of his presidency. But at the beginning, he was trying to make some gestures. Thank you. Uh, this morning, right before I came here, I happened to have the news on, and President Trump was at the uh, African American Museum in Washington, oh, yeah. D.C. Hmm. And he offered some comments. He first spoke about anti-Semitism um, and how terrible it is. And then he moved on to issues of race. One of the people he had on the stage was, I believe, the niece of Martin Luther King. Uh. He also had Ben Carson on the stage. Um, and he had the director of the museum. And uh, obviously, part of that was grandstanding no. or, or self-laudatory behavior. but. I actually found some of his comments to be more conciliatory and less combative than what I'm used to hearing out of him. And I just want to get your perspective. Obviously, you haven't seen the, the, the clip, but do I take from it that it was merely a symbolic gesture and to get some airtime, or do I try and look at it in a more constructive light over maybe he is going to try and do something to bridge the gap? No, so, I, I, I think given the way expectations have been set that any, any development like this would have to be viewed favorably. Um, even, even symbolic gestures have some value. I mean, one of the, one of the things that has most concerned students of, of the presidency, and my, you know, my, I, I have a sort of interest in a race portfolio, but much more broadly the presidency. One of, one of my uh, concerns has been that President Trump hasn't understood the value of his words and that a, a politician in that position who doesn't understand the value of his words is a bit like giving a loaded gun to a five-year-old child. Um, that nothing bad may happen, but you don't know and you can't count on it and the cognizance of the person who's in possession of the weapon gives you no confidence one way or the other. So to the extent that there is um, a, 
a positive use of presidential rhetoric. I would consider that to be a step forward. I think um, under those terms, we simply have to modify our expectations because we're dealing with a president who is unlike any president we've seen ever. And uh, so I guess you take your victories where you can get them and, and hope that maybe it's a, a portent of, of, of more, but at least it's not a continuation of the, um, of, of the ill portents, that the, the weapon hasn't been fired in a, in a, in a harmful way. I'd encourage you to, uh Russell happens to have a copy of one in front of him there, but uh, l to go to the website for the first year project that I've been talking about, first uh, go to POTUS2017.org um, and look under the race volume. There's several essays there. That's one of them. That's the one that I wrote uh, uh, that are kind of um, letters to the president from scholars or others of kind of here's, here's what we would suggest you, you might consider. Mine is by far the most uh, friendly to President Trump. Uh, and essentially, it, and I mean, many people in this room, if you read it, will, will might be shocked uh, by it. And um, I, I would also encourage you to go back and look at Doug's panel from last week. He talked about yeah. this as we were beginning. Look, I'm self-conscious enough to know that you've got two white Southern guys up here on the, st on the stage talking about the issue of race or something, you know, a, a bit ironic about that. But Doug, is, uh, is just coming back from Atlanta having been on the stage with some people who lived this experience, and it's, it's, it's a very worthwhile. It was a remarkable panel, yeah. it really was. Uh, and, but this essay, the essay that I wrote for the First Year Project, is specifically a, uh, I say that President Trump could in fact accomplish great things, could in fact be a historic figure if he uh, uh, were to consider some specific things, some symbolic and some more substantive. The more I come here and the more I listen, it seems like in politics, the only thing that motivates politicians is what's expedient politically or pressure from whoever it may be. And that goes for our Congress, too. Is it too utopian to think that anyone ever does anything because it's the best thing to do for the country? I think on, on on the question of, of race, and, and I've tried to carve this out and, and um, probably an unspoken predicate that maybe I should have uh, emphasized, is that, that race is a different kind of issue. That, uh, that there is, because of its um, very delicacy, uh, it, it, uh, it it's tended historically to set people on edge. Look, we're, we come out of a culture where one black of drop, uh, one drop of black blood was considered sufficient for somebody to be considered uh, a black American. That's that's a that's metaphorically a, a a powerful thing to understand in terms of following the um, the delicate nature of this issue. And I so I would say that when it comes to issues of race, that I don't think you see a lot of of uh, of uh, principled positions on this because people are not, uh, they're not geared that way on, on issues of race. I can't, I, I wouldn't generalize from this one matter to other issues, but, uh, you know, as a student of American politics, I, I you know, I, we probably are guilty of overlooking the, op the, the instances where people are operating out of altruistic notions or how one comes to understand altruism in the exercise of their public affairs. I dare say that if you would go interview members of Congress, they would say, no, I vote on principle all the time. It's those of us who are on the outside question, uh, you know, question their interpretation of what they're doing. But it's a, you know, it's a well-taken point. Let me, let, let me say, make one further comment on this in a way that may help you. I have one of the world's great jobs. I mean, apart from, from this book, which was done a long time ago, I, I help run the Presidential Oral History Program here. And we spend a day and a half with senior officials from every presidential administration, Democrats and Republicans. My interviewing goes back to Jimmy Carter's time, and I've probably done, I don't know, maybe 1,500, 2,000 hours of these interviews. One of the things that I always feel comfortable, uh, and I occasionally get a chance to teach, uh, one of the things that I always feel comfortable doing is going into my classes and saying, I, I want to tell you that you are being well served, that 
whether you are a Democrat or Republican, regardless of which administration, and I, and I will, will draw the line before Obama because I haven't interviewed anybody from Obama and I want to be empirical about this, but in my interviews covering the presidency from Jimmy Carter to George W. Bush, my experience has almost uniformly been one of deep appreciation, not affection, but respect for the people that I talk with. It's because they are, they are much brighter than you would expect from the caricatures that you see on television, even the ones that you think are real dolts. When you get down and you, and you start talking with them in person, you find out these are people who are very thoughtful folks and they are motivated exactly the way you want them to be motivated. They are motivated by a deep sense of patriotism, and it comes out in various ways. Sure, we, we view it by partisan dimensions, but part of this, I'm no Donald Trump on the press, but I do think the press uh, is, you know, is partly responsible for this, and, and for good reason. We, we want a, a press to be adversarial. That's what even Thomas Jefferson expected, as much as he disliked the press. So. The argument about, about altruism, I couldn't say that they are all altruistically motivated, but what I can say is that they are motivated by what they think is in the best interest of the United States of America, and I may disagree with them, but there is something comforting in having experience after experience after experience where I walk out of this interview room with somebody that I was prepared to dislike and disrespect and after eight hours, I've been converted. And so I can tell you that, um, that there are good folks doing good things, even when we disagree with them. That's certainly my experience, too. I think it's an important thing to remember that, because you do hear a lot about why won't any quality person run for office or run for president. And the truth is that the people who run for president are quality people. Uh, even Donald Trump at some level is a quality person, regardless of one's <laughs> thoughts, I suspect, um, uh, based on some past conduct. But, the, but, you know, it also is, all of this is also an expression of what a spectacularly impossible job it is to be president of the United States, because we ask, of presidents of this country to do something that leaders of countries uh, historically were not asked to do, and that is to balance the interests of, of the individual uh, leader of the country and the people against notions of justice and liberty and you know sort of human ideals of the Enlightenment. That's not something that we asked of all world leaders over time. It's not something Vladimir Putin has asked to, uh, to balance in any fashion. Um, and so our presidents are faced with, again and again, with these uh, these balancing acts uh, that, and it is particularly difficult to make a decision to say, okay, we're gonna have a, we're gonna take steps that will lead to the dissolution of the union in a four year long war in which 600,000 Americans will be killed. Uh, a whole series of incredibly terrible things are gonna have to happen so that we can, uh, so that we can ensure the emancipation of four million African Americans, who my pastor says to me every week if I ask, are the equivalent of the cows in the field, not the equivalent of my children. Mm -hmm. You know, well, so to, so to ask a president to, uh, uh, to, in that inverted morality of that context, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a, that's a big leap, and you see that over and over again. Uh, and so it's not just, uh, it's not necessarily a cynical thing, but it is that it's the people and our evolving yeah. notions of justice that finally push presidents to understand that that the sustenance uh, and security of the nation demands a different response, you know, and that's how progress happens. I really uh, enjoyed that, and the theme of the conundrum, the dilemma, the conflicts for a president for supporting the union and then having the problem of moral dilemmas. And you mentioned Lincoln, and you start with Andrew Jackson. But I, I think it really starts with the framers, with the Continental Congress and the decisions made. Most of the, many of the Southern leaders saw slavery as evil. But when it finally came up to deciding how these 13, how everything was gonna work, they tabled it. It was too hot to handle. Mm -hmm. They were gonna do it later. We had a civil war. Sort of a theme, if you don't deal with things up front, they get worse often. Yeah. I wonder if you have some comment, because I wonder if the start of your theme is not with the framers. Oh, oh sure. I mean, I think you've got a, uh, a, a constitutional framework where there is, um, you know, there, there, there are bargains involved. There, there are compromises involved. And it's, we're very uncomfortable with compromising on, on moral issues. And yet the framers had to compromise on this in order to 
uh, in order to make things happen. I think if I'm, you know, if, if you're trying to be optimistic about the interpretation, though, you look at, at you know, what, what Martin Luther King Jr. said, which is it was a promissory, the Constitution was a promissory note. He didn't say, he was not like William Lloyd Garrison, who after the Compromise of 1850, took a match and burned the Constitution, so that's what I think of your Constitution if you're gonna, if, 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 if you're gonna continue slavery. King said, no, this Constitution is a wonderful document because it's, it's, it's the basis for what we're about to accomplish. It, cre it gives us a framework for, for bringing our grievances to, to a government and provides us the, the venue for, uh, uh, for raising our moral claims in a, in a political system that will only act because it understands its hypocrisy, okay? And so, uh, sure, the, the way that the Constitution was framed, it had some unfortunate compromises in it, but I, you know, I follow King on this, that, that the, the existence of that Constitution made possible the kinds of changes in the American system that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Doug, I'll... I'll it's what you would call original sin. There you go. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get ahead of the curve on what may be the next uh, big civil rights issue, um, look at North Dakota right now, okay. at the uh, pipeline out there and what's happened. Uh, generally, Indian tribes have been, uh, or Native Americans, have been pushed to the back or to the side or under. And all of a sudden, with this Dakota pipeline, we have thousands of uh, um, military people and, and regular citizens going out to help. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that's gonna be one of the next big civil rights issues. I, I, I think you might very well be right. And it, it raises an interesting parallel. You know, President Trump has has laid claims to wanting to be Andrew Jackson. That's his, you know, I think Jackson's portrait now hangs there. And boy, Jackson's history with uh, Indians is one of the most ugly episodes in uh, uh, American politics. So, you know, it's, it's also fascinating that uh, Andrew Jackson was the only, pro you know, uh, the first um, uh, set of scholarly evaluations of American presidents happened in, I think, 1946. Arthur M. Schlesinger, Sr. surveyed scholars, and Andrew Jackson was, in the, was ranked in the top tier of those presidents. He was the only president to fall out of that top tier when Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. Uh, redid the survey, I think, in the middle of the 1960s. And my understanding, there was a C-SPAN uh, survey that came out a few days ago where Jackson had tumbled a little bit further. Uh, Jackson is the only president in American history to have done that, where, who, had, who had at one point had been in the top tier and then had fallen out largely on the basis of an understanding of, uh, I, I think, less on black Americans, but certainly on, on uh, Indians. So that, I... I accept your challenge, and we'll spend some time watching that. And I spent some time in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, yeah. and uh, the natives out there <coughs> refused to acknowledge that man. Uh, in oh. fact, uh, there was uh, Jefferson Jackson Day yeah. uh, around the country. The uh, Native Americans in Arizona said, not in my state, well, not I in my and I think, I believe that there's a, uh, an A-section story, it's either in the Post or the Times this morning, about uh, concerns over border areas where tribal lands are in effectively the United States and Mexico. And the question is, what are you going to, are you going to build a fence right down the middle, cutting them off from, yeah. yeah. Russell Riley, thank you thank again. Thank you very this much. This was very nice. Everybody.